First of all, I'd just like to thank you for, um, for inviting me to speak today. Um, it's great to see all the familiar faces that I, I've known for a while now, but I think it's even better to see so many new people come to, to this event this weekend and, and get to meet um, so many new people that are interested in, in ideas that for us are essential in, in the fight for a better, better world. And, um, and within that, I think discussing the question of uh, women or what, what role women can play in, um, in, in, in bettering society really is, is essential as well. So I'm just going to move that out of the way. Um, as, uh, and as Tash said, these, these uh, texts were quite fundamental in uh, allowing me to gain a better understanding of, uh, of what the women's struggle is and also what the, the Bolshevik party was able to achieve in relation to women's liberation. So I strongly recommend that um, you take a look at, at, these, uh, at this material. Um, but going to sort of the, what we're here to discuss today and what I hope I can um, sort of enlighten you a little bit about and, and have a bit of a discussion about. Uh, what, what role did women play in, in the Russian Revolution and what was sort of the situation in, in the, what we would call the bourgeois family uh, in the period of the Russian Revolution and the years after? Well, the 23rd of February by the old Russian calendar um, was the equivalent of today's 8th of March. It was International Women's Day. And in the year 1917, um, there was a mass demonstration of uh, women in Petrograd. Uh, this demonstration was led by striking textile women workers. Um, and this demonstration marched onto the Duma, demanding bread, demanding basic needs for, for the family, demanding basic needs for, for children. Um, and obviously, as, as we still see today, the, the Tsarist government made every attempt to, uh, to crush the demonstration, to crush the, the, um, the call for liberation of these women on, uh, on International Women's Day. But you see, the fact is, is that uh, you'll often see that women have a lot more to, to win in a, in a revolutionary situation, and they've got a lot less to lose. And so they carried on on that day. And it also helped that there was another 90,000 uh, workers that were out on strike supporting uh, the cause of women's liberation. Uh, and that's also without counting a solidarity strike that was taking place of, uh, of washerwomen who were actually demanding the nationalization of, uh, of laundries under the control of, um, of the local authorities. Now, interestingly, this position of the, of the washerwomen was considered premature by the Mensheviks. They considered this to be quite a, a premature demand that, um, that, sort of the, that Russian society wasn't quite at the right stage in history to be demanding something like that. But the Bolsheviks were the only ones that gave full support to this demand. And in fact, um, uh, sort of enabled these women to go forward, to push forward and, and carry on in, in the struggle. Um, and therefore, the, the women that were out demonstrating were able to gain the support of those same soldiers that were sent out to repress the demonstration. Um, and these soldiers ended up actually turning their bayonets uh, not towards the, the women that were demonstrating, but towards the, the, the czarist uh, regime in, uh, in, um, in Russia. This is one of the events that, that marked the beginning of the Great Russian Revolution. And it's important for, for women to remember that. It's important for women to know that, uh, to, to give them courage to, to do the same today, essentially. The, the Russian Revolution marked a period that was the, the first time in history that, uh, that the working class seized power and was able to begin, to begin running society um, democratically for themselves. And, it, and it's also, uh, secondly to that, it's an important, incredibly important landmark for the question of, uh, of women's liberation. 
because the demands of the Bolsheviks, the demands of the, the revolution itself, um, included um, the need to occupy the shut-in private um, enterprise that is the family um, and replace it with, with social care, with social housing, um, to allow the absorption of all the privately sort of um, the private housekeeping functions of the family, for the, to allow the, the social absorption of these uh, of these functions by social by public institutions, and this was uh, a way to to liberate women from that um, nucleus, let's say. Um, and this, um, the Bolsheviks understood that this was only going to be possible if the commanding heights of the economy were to be na nationalized in the interest of the masses, in the interest of, of women uh, as well. And this, obviously, uh, doing this would have, um, well, it did, as, as I'll, I'll, I'll explain, it, it, it allowed w women to be free. Uh, it liberated women from the role that they have in, in that family and allowed them to participate fully in the running of society. Um, I think a, a good way to, uh, to explain what, what socialism um, aims to, to, uh, to accomplish is, uh, as, as Marx, Marx's characterization of a socialist society gives quite a good example of this or explains it quite well, he said... Um, it would be a society in which um, uh, the, the sentence is from each according to their ability, and that means both in a physical sense but also in a psychological sense what their ability is, to each according to what their need is. Now this in itself, is, uh, is, uh, this in itself highlights that w men and women have different abilities and they have different needs. So that this sentence in itself kind of, you know, immediately wipes away any illusion that communism uh, aims to, to have, you know, equality between genders in a mechanical sense. It's, we're not talking about equality between people in a mechanical sense. Um, we're talking about distributing the, the wealth in society for all in an equal manner. But we do understand that, obviously, um, every individual has different abilities and every individual has different needs. Um, the revolution uh, was, was very important because it demanded that um, the majority of society would be educated in order to be able to run society. So there was, there was a demand for further education um, and that obviously included uh, allowing people to understand that motherhood is an important social um, uh, function. It's a productive social function. Um, and that essentially women are the mothers of humanity. And the, the, the Russian Revolution aimed for this to be protected as such, aimed for motherhood to be protected in that way. It also... Um, uh, demanded for people to understand that abortion is not something that uh, is easily carried out by women, but very often it's, it's a necessity. Um, it's something that women are compelled to, into doing because of you know, the, the, the social conditions that they're, they're in and, and the, the option of raising a child in poverty is not exactly um, appealing, let's say. And so it's an act of necessity. And the Russian Revolution had the aim not only of, of enabling people to understand this, but actually to remove any cause, any, any cause that, would, that would lead a woman to have an abortion. And also, th th it was important for society to understand that the emancipation of the woman was actually a, a lever for the emancipation of man. And that... Um, as Camilla Ravera said, the, the woman will not be free until the man is also free. Um, Trotsky, uh, in, in, in this wonderful uh, text, says that, that women, women are the mothers of the nation. And that, that, that in a way implies that, um, 
it implies that the enslavement of the woman, that her enslavement will therefore breed uh, further prejudice, it will breed, breed further enslavement, um, and that highlights the need to, to liberate her, and, and it's only with the help of the working class that we will be able to achieve um, and uh, fulfill the demands of women's liberation, allow them to become a reality. Now, the demands of the Russian Revolution were not just like dreamt of by the Bolshevik uh, party, by the leaders of the Bolshevik party, but they were actually based on a series of, uh, of needs that women have. Um, and therefore, the demands were to abolish all that tortures, all that um, humiliates and oppresses women in the household, in the workplace, and in the, in the, at the time in the peasantry. Um, and, and so therefore it was not just a question of, uh, of sort of fighting for women's demands on, on the surface of things, but it was necessary to go right to the core of, of what the, to go to the origins of, uh, of what oppresses women, of how women's oppression has, uh, has arised. And so, very briefly, I'm going to try to just give you a kind of an, uh, an overlook of, of what, um, what happened in order to, uh, to bring women into this position. So Marxism has analyzed the origins of women's oppression and, uh, and in a way laid the theoretical basis, or this has allowed Marxism to lay a theoretical basis to overcome it. Um, so with the settling of hunter-gatherer societies, um, there, there came also a division of, of labor in which women dedicated more time to raising the children, more time to um, sort of dealing with household domestic tasks, and the man uh, sort of dedicated their time to um, increasing production of, in agriculture and cattle raising. So there was a distinct sort of um, uh, yeah, division of labor, let's say. Um, so the, 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 the labor of the man actually allowed him or gave him the capacity to, sub to produce a surplus, i.e. more than was uh, necessary to the individual or to that clan. And uh, this therefore marked a distinctive change in the, in the balance of forces within the family, within the clans uh, that had uh, settled. Because obviously the labor of the, it was the labor of the man that allowed for trade and it allowed for uh, development of private property, and therefore it was um, a tool for further enrichment, for further wealth to be produced. Um, whereas the labor of the women was not as productive in the eyes of, uh, of that economic structure. Let's say the, uh, the, the, the labor of the, of the women did not produce uh, um, a value in that way, a, a productive value. Um, and this uh, further on led to the abolition of what was called the mother right, which in a polygamous society, in a, in a polygamous clan, would have been the only way to determine sort of what the family line was, um, because obviously women are the ones that, that, that give birth. So it, it, that was sort of the way in which um, the line in the, in the clan was determined. And that was replaced with the, the, the rise of class society, that was, uh, or, or the rise of private property, that was replaced by father right. Um, because obviously uh, the men that were producing the private property wanted to have someone to, to pass that private property on to, essentially, to maintain it into, uh, to keep it inside um, uh, the realms of, of, of the clan, of the family. <laughs> So therefore, they wanted to be able to pass that property on to uh, a blood-related heir, essentially. And what that meant was uh, essentially that women became the, the kind of uh, um, uh, heir-producing property of men. Um, and, uh, and along with that, what, what that meant was that women were forced, also forced into a monogamous relationship with men, whereas men obviously uh, were not compelled to, to do the same. 
Um, so really, it's it's uh, this is just kind of to say that it's it's absurd to think that that women, uh, you know, since the beginning of time, have been socially inferior to men, uh, and it's absurd to to think that there's a functional reason for why or a functional significance to the role of women in society um, that this division of labor is you know was meant to be or or is is the way that humans uh, have developed naturally let's say and this culture you might you might ask yourself well how did it become such a predominant <coughs> idea in society well that this culture of uh, the pa the patriarchal culture really spread was able to spread through trade because the different clans having developed the private property were trading with other clans and that allowed for those ideas also to go along with the the trading um, and also it's, uh, it's interesting that religion definitely played a part in sort of, um, or religion assisted this process of uh, spreading of culture. I'd just like to, to read out something um, that was written by uh, the so-called, he was the, an abbot, Abbot Rosmini, um, and he was a, a contemporary of Marx, and he was a political advisor in Italy. And he, he says... That it is for the health. This is, um, by the way, sort of a sentence that is, uh, or a concept that is used in educating young girls, that was used in educating young girls in Italy. So it is for the husband, according to the convenience of nature, to be lord and master. It is for the woman, and so it should be, to be almost an appendage, a complement to the husband entirely consecrated to him and dominated by his name. Now this might seem like in completely backward and you know appalling to most of you, but it actually formed, um, it was inscribed in law in Italy up till 1975, uh, when a series of uh, very, very um, sort of uh, uh, courageous women uh, fought for, for this to be um, abolished, let's say. Um, so, another sort of uh, uh, concept is that capitalism. Obviously, this this implies that capitalism was did not mark that capitalism did not um, did not create women's oppression, but it definitely is a major obstacle in uh, in overcoming women's oppression because uh, capitalism encourages all possible divisions within the working class, not just the division between men and women, but the division between people of different color, uh, of skin, people of different uh, sexuality. There's all possible divisions that have been dreamt up of by the capitalist uh, um, ruling class. Um, and, and also the patriarchal ad, um, culture in capitalism guarantees a layer of, uh, of uh, women's labor um, that, can, that is cheap, that is very cheap, that can be sort of pushed in and out of the labor market when, uh, when it's needed, essentially, when it's, when it's required by the capitalist system. Um, and it also, capitalism also unloads a series of responsibilities onto the family, onto the family <coughs> nucleus. Um, so obviously what that implies is that it, it, it's unloading these responsibilities onto the woman that is, um, in, we could say, enslaved in the household. Um, and, and families within capitalism have further developed uh, into becoming sort of a, a, an entity or a private entity that has to economically sort of provide for itself, you could say, um, and be um, uh, self-sufficient in a way, especially self-sufficient with relation to uh, domestic tasks. You know, we, we rely on our, our family nucleus for our clothes to be washed, for our food to be made, uh, and so on. And this obviously uh, is, is the reason that, that um, or it's very convenient uh, to have one individual that takes care of these responsibilities in the family, and that is the woman. But obviously that means is that, what that means is that women are taken away from social production and uh, engaged in, in private production. And so therefore women are confined to 
uh, the structure of the family. Now, uh, going back to sort of the Russian Revolution, what was what was the role of women in the Russian Revolution? Well, um, Lenin in in this um, you can you can purchase this uh, this uh, ver this um, issue of the IDOM, um, in which uh, there's a quote from Lenin, in which he says that um, in Petrograd, here in Moscow, in other towns and industrial centers. The women workers acted splendidly during the revolution. Without them, we should not have been victorious, or scarcely so. This is my opinion. How brave they were, how brave they still are. Think of all the suffering and deprivations that they bore. All, um, and they are carrying on because they want freedom, they want communism. Yes, our proletarian women were excellent class fighters. And he goes on to saying that the energy, the willingness and the enthusiasm of the women comrades, uh, their courage and wisdom in times of illegality or semi-legality is an indication of the good prospects for the development of the work in Russia. So women clearly had uh, important roles in all aspects of organization, uh, of political organization. In the party, uh, it's important to say that in the Bolshevik party, women had the same standing as men. Uh, they, they, did, they were not sort of uh, given privileged positions in the party. Um, they had equal rights and equal responsibilities as men did in the, in the party. Um, because after all, a woman communist is no different from a man communist and therefore uh, should not be given a, a privileged position. Women played an important role in educating the, the party ranks, um, in educating the party team ranks as to what the methods of female life are and how to uh, assist their needs. Um, and. I guess this is a good way to explain why this was, is Trotsky said that in order to change the conditions of life, we must learn to see them through the eyes of a woman. And this is exactly what the Bolsheviks did uh, in the, uh, with the Russian Revolution and the period following that. Women were vital in conducting work among other women that were not already part of the, the Bolshevik party, that had not joined the ranks of the Bolshevik party. And this, is, this was not feminist agitation. It's important to say it wasn't just, uh, they weren't just tackling sort of uh, feminists, they weren't conducting feminist propaganda. But what they were actually doing was conducting um, sort of, it was, it was doing socialist agitation within groups of women, which I think is, we can talk about that a bit more in the discussion, but I think it's, it's quite a fundamental point uh, to understand. And actually, <laughs> something that Lenin said, which is, which is quite, uh, quite funny, I think, he said, he said that work among women is not feminism, but it's actually revolutionary expediency. <laughs> so um, I like to remember that. So women went into the factories, they went into workplaces, they went into homes, and they related the experiences of the women that they were speaking to in one place with the the experiences of the women that they were speaking with in another place and they educated them regarding uh, sort of the, the ideas of communism um, they produced communist literature they had a newspaper Komunitska and, uh, and this served the purpose to provide these women with revolutionary ideas with the idea that uh, capitalism needed to be overthrown in order to fulfill the demands of, uh, of the liberation of women and also, uh, the, the newspaper was also used to report on the daily experiences of women in different places. Um, and obviously, the women that were already in the, in the party made every effort to involve the women that they met outside of the party ranks in the work of the Bolshevik party. And the, the Bolsheviks emphasized at all stages the need um, to not not create separate women's organizations that you know the women that were conducting this work were not to aim to achieve sort of to create a separate organization but to um, to bring the women inside the Bolshevik party to conduct work inside the Bolshevik party with these women and this this work was actually so successful that in 1919 a section of the central committee of uh, the Bolsheviks um, well a section was established uh, 
to to be dedicated to dedicate itself entirely to agitation amongst women um, and I can't pronounce this very well but it's I think it's Zen Zenotel uh, you pronounce it and it was the name of the group of the committee that had the task of organizing amongst women and this was led by Alexandra Kolontai and Inessa Armand um, and this was never uh, a separate organization. They, they really sort of um, carried on that work truthfully and, uh, and never, uh, never sort of yeah, carried, carried on any work outside of the party ranks. But their aim was solely to bring women inside the party. Um, and it, the work was so successful that by 1927, they actually uh, had issued 400,000 copies of their newspaper, Komunitska. And uh, by 1928, there was 2.5 million women that were organized in uh, socialist discussion groups. So, I mean, I remind you of the context of, uh, of extremely backward uh, Russia as well that this happened in. But the revolution, uh, I think, demonstrates above, above all that women are an integral part of, uh, of the structure of a communist society. Um, and, and the Bolsheviks absolutely understood this. And in fact, at the third congress of the Third International, they, um, they approved a document that stated that unless millions of women are with us, it will be impossible to realize communism. And I must say, I think every day of the existence of the Soviet Union demonstrated that and proved their theory, let's say. Because the involvement of women in the decision making and uh, in the, in, yeah, the, the, the involvement of women in the decision making that occurred sort of in, structure, in restructuring society guaranteed the socialization of those tasks guaranteed um, sort of the the exportation of the of the domestic tasks into society and out of the household but really why what <laughs> moving on to sort of like what what were the achievements of the Russian Revolution and and why are these important what were the achievements in relation to the women's question and and why is it important to discuss what the achievements of uh, of the of the revolution were in relation to women well, um, Marx and Engels said that the degree of emancipation of women is the natural measure of the degree of universal emancipation. And, uh, and Fourier, who was a, a French utopian socialist, also said that social progress is measured by the progress of women towards freedom. And that the position of women in any social re regime is a graphic indicator of the health of that regime. And I think, it's, I think therefore, it's safe to say that, uh, that the Bolsheviks and the, the Russian Revolution definitely fulfilled every obligation that they had in relation to, um, to women and women's liberation. In fact, women's, the, women's, uh, women's demands were no longer an object of struggle. They were no longer a bargaining tool like we see today that is used by the ruling class, but that is used by the bourgeoisie. It's no, it's no longer, they were no longer sort of, you know, that, that bargaining tool used when, uh, when the working class moves into struggle, but they actually uh, formed uh, part of the structure of the communist society. Uh, they became a reality. And after, in fact, so after the Bolsheviks actually conquered power, they immediately passed a series of laws that uh, gave women uh, formal equality or formal, like liberation in a formal sense, let's say. But Lenin was very, very uh, clear in emphasizing that there was a need to build a material basis in order to support that formal liberation in order to make that formal or to sustain that formal liberation. And, and this was to be done by, pl by planning the economy and, and, so and socializing the household tasks. So in relation to, uh, to pregnancy and health, um, the, the, the revolution gave women the right to abortion in 1920. 
and this was to, uh, done in order to, to abolish the condition of menace that women find themselves in when they're forced to uh, have a child in a situation of poverty. And Russia was actually, uh, well, Soviet Russia was actually the first country on earth to legalize abortion. Uh, women had a right to maternity leave uh, for a period of up to one year. Um, pregnancy consultation centers were built, maternity homes were built, and that also sort of led to the fact that life expectancy amongst women uh, more than doubled to 74 years uh, of age by the 1970s, and that was going from 30, an average of 30 years in, uh, in Zara's times. They, a, a department for the protection of mother and child was appointed uh, by uh, Alexandra Kollontai in 1918. And women were exempt from he heavy labor. It was illegal to fire pregnant women. Uh, and women ha were exempt from uh, carrying out night shifts. As Trotsky said, the question of motherhood is above all a question of housing, a question of having running water, and a question of having a great enough food supply. And the consideration, having consideration for the mother is uh, the truest and deepest way of improving the fate of, of the child. And in fact, uh, <coughs> consequently to all the, 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 um, the changes that were implemented, the child mortality fell by 1925. Um, in the Vladimir province, it was 17.5%. Uh, by 1925, whereas it was 29% in 1913. And in the Moscow province, it fell to 14%, and it was 28% in 1913. There were free school meals uh, for children that had milk and so on. Uh, food and clothes were provided for orphans. Uh, kindergartens and schools were available to all children uh, in an indiscriminate manner. Um, now, in relation to marriage, um, women had a right to divorce, and uh, the, the 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 sort of the and th this could be requested by either party. So it could be requested. It's important to say that that women could request um, the divorce as well. And if the spouse was unemployed, so if the woman was unemployed, uh, she was given six months subsistence. And what this did was it liberated her from the economic dependence of the relationship with the man. Um, so uh, uh, also husband and wife were considered equal in the eyes of the law. Um, and social housing provided... Um, sort of the, the role that social housing played was that it also it provided uh, a home for the divorcee so if a woman divorced a man they had she had a place to go essentially she wasn't tied to to the home with the with the man civil partnership was legalized within 6 weeks following the revolution and in relation to freeing women from domestic slavery there were social dining rooms that were uh, built Public laundries were, were built, public seamstresses were, uh, were, were also built, and uh, things like prostitution were replaced with um, paid social production. So a woman was involved in, in social production and didn't have to result to selling her body. There was equal pay in the workplace, and women were given insurance <coughs> if they were to fall ill or pregnant. And this was all done to, to maintain that economic independence, even if she was unable to work, even if she was unable to, to produce socially, let's say. And this meant that as a whole, women were no longer discriminated against in, uh, because of their gender. They were no longer in the workplace, they were no, no longer discriminated against. And this is because with socialism, with, with the development of socialism, the overall productivity of labor increases. And this means that the amount of labor necessary uh, to produce the necessities of life by a single individual decreases. And therefore, pregnancy, in, in the case of a woman, no longer hinders uh, her ability to contribute to social production. Uh, and so therefore, 
questions such as pregnancy, questions such as gender, become irrelevant in that economic situation. In relation to education, 49% uh, percent, percent of students were in higher education. Uh, sorry, 49% of students that were in higher education were women, were women uh, by the 1970s. And, uh, and by that time, only Finland, France, and the USA had more than 40% of women in higher education. Um, so you could say that, in a way, you could say that being against the Third International was like being against the emancipation of women. Uh, it was, it was, that, that's, so that's one of the main tasks of the, of the, of the Third International. Now, change outside of the family uh, in, in relation to, to, to social production um, inevitably marks a change within, a change within the family as well. Uh, so the, that's mainly because the way that people live is determined by the, the development of the means of subsistence and the development of the, of the social institutions in society. So the stru social structures in society, such as the family, uh, will, will be linked to the degree of development of the, social, of the productive forces. Therefore, uh, this, this implies that, that families can't just be abolished. It's, it's, it's not possible to just, from one day to the other, abolish the family. But the family must be, uh, must be replaced with something else. Um, and in, uh, in, in Russia, what happened was, uh, in Russia there was the transference of the economic and educational functions of the family... Uh, these were transferred over to, um, over to society, which was able to provide economic freedom for the family. Um, and in fact, what this meant was that the old social ties in the family were broken, and new, um, new ideological relations began to arise in the family. <coughs> and therefore, what this means is that there was no economic pressure on the woman to remain in a relationship with the man to re to remain inside of the household because essentially there was there was a lack you could say of a, a social economic pressure on the woman to produce an heir for the private property of that family and in this circumstance obviously the the bond between a man or a woman or or it would be possible for society to allow for a woman and a woman to be in a relationship, or for a man and a man to be a relationship, to be in a relationship, because there's no, um, there's there's not an economic uh, determinant on on that relationship. So the bond between individuals would solely be based on mutual affection, and it wouldn't have an economic base for the attachment. Furthermore, in the in the in the Russian Revolution, what was essential was that uh, the courage and uh, the courage of these women that went out and 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 realized what their potential was uh, inevitably also made itself felt in the family. Women went home and and demanded that the men of the family would respect them in the same way that that the Bolshevik Party respected them, that their that their that their communist comrades respected them. But sort of very briefly, it is, it is uh, important to mention what happened in the later years of the Soviet Union um, and that the, the, the Russian Revolution was greatly isolated uh, and it was isolated in conditions of extreme poverty second to uh, the First World War, the, um, the, um, the Civil War, the consequences of the Civil War. And uh, Russia was invaded by over 21 imperialist countries. It had over 21 imperialist invasions. And there was still a great deal of cultural backwardness in, uh, in Soviet Russia. Um, so this uh, gave way to um, a Stalinist, what we would term a, a Stalinist degeneration. Um, if you were at the meeting last night, Alan, I think, uh, gave a, a brilliant lead-off explaining the process of this, so I won't, I won't go into it in too much detail, but what, it, what is worth explaining is what the effects of this were in relation to uh, the women's question and in relation to the family. So the, the bankruptcy of the state caused 
a restoration of uh, of, fam of uh, money relations, which later on uh, also saw forced collectivization of the peasantry and so on. And this really delayed the socialization of, of domestic tasks. Um, therefore, the bourgeois family could not be replaced. And people were forced to come together again, to glue together again, uh, to return home to, to dine because society could no longer provide that need. And therefore, there was a restoration of the old bourgeois family relations that took place, um, which inevitably meant also the return home of the woman, the, the, the enslavement of the woman. Um, and... and also, uh, sort of, to, to further enforce this, um, abortion was also uh, banned in, uh, in 1936. So these rights were, were, to an extent, taken away. But overall, it's just important to say that uh, the process of emancipation of women was immensely slowed down. Now, I've got to, I've got to sum up. Um, so... It's, I think it's just important to say about, in, in terms of what, what is our task today? So what, what can we learn from the Russian Revolution? What can we learn uh, with respect to what was achieved by the Russian Revolution? Uh, because this event today is completely written off by, by the bourgeois. You, know, you, you will not hear about uh, these achievements in any university, in any uh, bourgeois text. So it's important to mention these things here because it's it's an inconvenient truth essentially to to um, to the bourgeois to to the ruling class. Um, so the the Russian Revolution really demonstrated that uh, that. That it, it, it demonstrated to women the importance of the working class coming to power. It demonstrated also the importance of women being involved in that process. Uh, I think that's a major thing that we should take away from, from, from that. And I think the, the experience of the, of the Soviet Union taught, uh, or, or at least cleared away more prejudices than volumes of feminist literature could ever do. Uh, that experience alone is, is something that demonstrates um, what can be achieved. And in fact, it has taken capitalism a hundred years, we could say now, to achieve what was, by, what was achieved by the Bolsheviks in, in, in just a period of two years, in a condition of extreme poverty, extreme backwardness in Russia. Uh, and if we look at the conditions of women today, well... We're not really in, in a great situation if we look at society through the eyes of women today. Uh, women are still, there's still differences um, in terms of pay, there's still differences in terms of living conditions in different countries that have different uh, developments of, uh, of the productive forces. And uh, so today, sort of uh, the, the, the communists of today, the, the communist international of today, uh, has a is has has a need and and has to fight for progressive reforms for women, to to whatever extent is possible within capitalism, but above all, the communists of today must understand that we must first lay the material conditions that will enable for liberation of wi of women to become a reality. Um, with today, there's, there's billions of dollars that are in private hands that could be ripped away and poured into social production, that could be poured into uh, the social structures that, that maintain uh, people uh, today. And I think it's the, the, the main thing that we need to realise is that until the power of property, uh, of the power of capital and private property remains, it will be impossible for women to achieve um, an actual liberation. And that this will only allow her, or the, the greatest extent that we can see is that this will only allow her to also own private property in capitalism, and that women may also earn a wage and they may also have equal rights in front of bourgeois law. But these rights uh, are, are completely tied into the demands of the capitalist market. So these demands or these, these rights, rather, can be taken away 
depending on the, 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 the degree of, of, uh, of development of the capitalist system. And so, therefore, they're completely tied into that. And so, the women's question is not an extra issue to deal with uh, when we're talking about um, the, the emancipation of the working class as a whole. Uh, but it's, an, it's, it's actually a decisive issue that advances the struggle for, uh, or the struggle against capitalism. Now, I know I'm running far ahead, but there's one thing. I, when, I, when I started doing reading for this, uh, this lead-off, there was, there was something that I read that I thought, this is, this is what I have to do, right? This is when I, when I come and speak to this crowd, and this is, this is what Lenin is telling me to do today. Okay, so... <laughs> Uh, Lenin says that the thesis must clearly point out that real freedom for women is possible only through communism. The inseparable connection between the social and human position of women and private property in the means of production must be strongly brought out. That will draw a clear and eradicable line of distinction between our policy and feminism. And it will also supply the basis for regarding Women's, the women's question as a part of the social question of the workers' problem and so bind it firmly to the proletarian class struggle and the revolution. The communist women's movement must itself be a mass movement, a part of the general mass movement, not only of the proletariat, but of all the exploited and all the oppressed, all the victims of capitalism or any other misery. In that lies its significance for the class, str class struggles of the proletariat and for its historical creation, communist society. We can rightly be proud of the fact that in the party, in the communist international, we have the flower of rem revolutionary womankind. But that is not enough. We must win over to our side the millions of working women in the towns and villages, win them for our struggles and in particular for the communist transformation of society. There can be real, no real mass movement without women. So I hope this is what I have in some way uh, relayed to you. And I, I hope that all the women in this room that have uh, not yet joined our fellow comrade men in, uh, in, the, in the fight for our emancipation choose to do so today. Thank you.